They are an Indian people who have suffered for many years, forced to live in unimaginable squalor. Houses not much better than cardboard boxes. No running water, no sewage disposal. Human waste tossed into the streets where children played in it and dogs ate it. As their sense of worth disintegrated, they engaged in self-destructive behaviors. 90% of the community became alcoholic. Many of the children sniffed gas. Many more suffered from chronic disease. Stripped of culture, meaning, and hope, they killed themselves at a rate among the world's highest. But their tragedies did not occur in a third world country. They occurred in a country with a reputation as one of the best places in the world to live, Canada. They are the Innu. For thousands of years, they roamed strong and free, surviving on one of the harshest lands on Earth, the vast tundra of Labrador. But after 50 years under white control in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, they struggle daily to survive Canada. We're dying rapidly. The Innu you know, people are being just being used. It's an escape from, from the miseries. It's an acknowledgement that there is no hope. These depends can get well. If they're not well, the kids are not well. But we're human beings. We're not animals. How can this be? How can this be in Canada? Davis Inlet, Labrador, Canada. From 1967 to 2002, home of the Mushwa Innu. By 1993, Davis Inlet had become a blight on the international reputation of Canada. In that same year, the Canadian Human Rights Commission released a report condemning the federal government's treatment of the Innu. The report came to a shocking conclusion. It found the federal government had been in violation of the constitutional rights of the Innu for more than 50 years. Donald McRae, Dean of Law at the University of Ottawa, authored the report. I think the, my report makes it clear that the federal government did violate the uh, constitutional rights of the Innu by failing to recognize them as Indians within, within the meaning of the Indian Act. McRae made a number of recommendations to government, which included moving the Innu to a new community a move that would take 10 years to happen. In January of 2003, the first of 700 Innu moved to Natwashish, a mere 20 minute skidoo or boat ride from the slum of Davis Inlet. On this small island, two miles from the northeast coast of Labrador, the Innu became a lost people. Alcohol, substance abuse, child neglect, violence and suicide became a way of life. The Innu completed their move to the new community during the summer of 2003. Built by the Federal Government of Canada for more than $150 million, the modern community of Natwashish was to mark a new beginning, a fresh start for the much-plagued Innu. It was to be a time of sobriety and a time of hope, a new lease in what had been a life of genuine horror for the Innu. Here, new homes replaced the ramshackle slums of Davis. Water and sewage replaced the bucket and the filth and many counted on these changes to make a critical difference in the lives of the Innu. But they did not. In fact, by the fall of 2003, one thing had become abundantly clear. The problems of Davis Inlet had moved with them to Natwashish. The manifestations of pain and despair continued unabated. Community leaders Chief Simeon Jakovich, Proti Poker and Luke Rich continued to grapple with large-scale social problems. In fact, Many say the problems in the new community are worse than Davis. The alcoholism and all the stuff. I'm just saying this personally, it's gotten worse. No, this is worse than Davis. Davis wasn't this bad. I see the hurt. I see the anger. I see the frustration. I see the despair. The scale of gas sniffing is, is much higher than I've personally witnessed before in Davis in that. But the problems that were existing in Davis Inlet have simply been carried over here. And we said we didn't want to transport the problems of Natashish from Davis. But we are now seeing that happening now. We are now in more crisis. Mm -hmm. 
And when would that crisis end? How could the hopes of the new community fade so fast? Many Innu believe the answers lie in coming to grips with their past. In the past, that uh, since we've been uh, forced to live in the Naninu settlements, we've been forced to learn Naninu language, which we didn't know nothing about. And today, I don't think that, that the government of Canada or Newfoundland is quite aware of what the Innu people have gone through in the past 36, 37 years. We need to go back to the roots where the problem started. How did we get here? Who brought us here? We never asked for this abuse. If you don't know the, the past, you can't begin to understand the present. Um, and I'm not sure that we do a great job in our schools of helping non-Aboriginal Canadians to really understand the history that has led all of us to this place, because we share this place, we've built it together. But the Innu have two pasts, the imprisonment of Davis Inlet and the freedom of the tundra of long ago. The word Innu means human being. Once known as the Montanay Nascapi Indians, not to be confused with their neighbors, the Eskimo or Inuit, the Innu roamed the Labrador Quebec Peninsula for at least 6,000 years. They called their land Natasanan. Until the second half of the 20th century, the Innu lived as nomadic hunters. They journeyed through the vast interior in constant search of game. They were very active, very tough did feats of travel that uh, a European explorer w would be praised for, you know, throughout his life for having endured, and they did that every day. Mainly after the fur trade was established, they only sort of came into the posts, which were largely on the coast, um, for a few weeks a year and then disappeared for the rest of the year, so they were out of control of the authorities. Highly successful people, strong and independent. The Innu were among the last of Aboriginal peoples in North America to fall victim to colonialism and white world domination. But there were various theories at the time about how they had to make them more like white men and how they had to change them from a uh, nomadic uh, hunting culture into a more economic culture. In 1949, Newfoundland joined Canada. The Innu were excluded from the final terms of union. An earlier clause protecting Aboriginal rights had been literally penciled out. And with those few pencil strokes, the constitutional rights of the Innu were struck down. Following long-established colonial precedents, the government of the new province of Newfoundland set out to assimilate the Innu. In partnership with the oblate missionaries of the Catholic Church, government sought to clear the Innu from their land, then prepare them for a program of education, and economic rehabilitation. The Innu were never consulted. Early into Confederation, the federal government had not exercised its fiduciary responsibility to the native people of Newfoundland at the time of Confederation 1949, and were very inept in dealing with the Innu people and all the native people of the province uh, for a long time after that. Following Confederation, the Innu split into two groups. One group, the Montanay, settled near the Northwest River, where they now reside in the community known as Shehajit. The Niskapi, the Mushwa Innu of today, stayed up north and continued their nomadic ways. Their refusal to settle down made them difficult for authorities to control. Wanting to turn them into economic units in a white society, the Catholic Church and their oblate missionaries sought to gain control of the Innu. They belittled Innu independence. They punished those who participated in Innu religious activities. They portrayed nomadic life and Innu spiritual beliefs as the work of the devil. I can only imagine when, when, when our, our parents, our grandparents, when they were told our, our, our ways are evil, we're, we're worshiping the devil. How do, does a person feel about when he's told that he's worshiping the devil? And there were crosses on every, every and on the elderly people that they have crosses to get away from evil. And that evil is the, the, the way of life. To gain the required control over the nomadic Mushwa Innu, 
the church convinced government to place these Innu on an island in northern Labrador, a place that would become infamously known to the world as Davis Inlet. They promised the Innu a better life. Believing that, the Innu put up little resistance to the move, a move that would prove disastrous for them. Well, the houses didn't have running water. There really was, uh, they, the houses were uh, probably even at the time, in many respects, uh, substandard. The heating was never provided, the running water was never provided, the bathrooms were built and no baths uh, provided. Uh, so no, they never lived up to those, uh, those promises. There was running water for the school, there was running water for the, uh, the priest's uh, house, there was running water for the RCMP station, I think for the, uh, for the store. But the houses of the, uh, the Innu didn't have any running water. In Davis Inlet, the Innu fell under the authority of the Catholic Church and were largely forgotten by government and the outside world. There the Innu endured the stripping away of all they held dear, their culture, their religion, their pride, and self-esteem. First, they're promised this paradise of, of education, jobs, housing, and that. And then they lived the reality of disease, um, lack of, of sanitation, all, you know, all of these things. Th they might well believe first that paradise arrived, and then suddenly we're in hell. So much abuse that took, took place here. And they cannot be ignored. They, can, they have to be addressed in order people to get well. The tents were warmer than they were here. Like in, in the middle of the winter, the tents were really more comfortable than they are with those houses that we, have, that we had here. The living conditions in Davis Inlet shocked those who went there to work. The shacks were disgusting that they lived in. Um, they couldn't have had very much dignity in their life. Uh, definitely not much culture left because of what they were trying to survive in. Uh, it took all dignity away. Uh, I would go to visit elders and people that were ill and um, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And no bathrooms, no running water. I can remember people coming in for a visit and saying, these people stink. Okay, well, you do uh, everything with one bucket of water a day. You go down to the well, and you freeze, and you pump that water, and you bring home a bucket, a white bucket, and then you try to bath in that, and bath all the children, and, and clean your house. And It's easy to say, you know, well, all they needed to do was soap and water. Yeah, but get it. I've never been in a third world country, but I can't imagine you know, that a third world country could be any worse than Davis was. Davis was a dump. <sighs> the report makes clear that nothing had changed. The houses still didn't have any running water. Things, things had gotten worse in terms of the conditions in which people lived in the community by 1993. Life in Davis Inlet took a horrible toll on the Innu. 95% of the community became affected by alcohol or substance addiction, either directly or indirectly. And they told us that life would be better here, but it wasn't. And gradually you see people drinking. A lot of my parents started drinking. My mother didn't, never drank before, but she started drinking when, when we moved here. And you see a lot of violence, and there was lots, there was fighting amongst them. 71% of Inno deaths were alcohol related, mostly young people. On Valentine's Day in 1992, six children burned to death in a house fire. Their parents had been out drinking. The community built a memorial on the site of the fire that killed the children. We were just talking uh, probably about the fire here. My nieces, my nephews, they were drinking that night and they left their kids. The house caught, caught on fire. And I can remember that night coming here. The fire only just started. And we tried to pull it out with, with buckets and snow. The flames got too hot, we couldn't get close to the house. And we, couldn't, we could only watch, couldn't do anything at all. We are helpless. We, and I, ran, and I, I got on my skidoo, I went all over all the houses. I checked all the houses to find a kid looking for those kids. I checked over there, but there, there's no sign of them. Then, then I realized they were in that fire. The government of Canada is responsible 
they put our people here and they promise all kinds of promises like wanting water and 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 yet they build this house with no fire protection nothing to fight with, with fire and I think Canada is responsible for this they are responsible in my own eyes they are responsible